Just give me a second to make sure uh, this actually works. Oh, look at that. That's not that bad. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again, Millen, for introducing me. Um, that was that was about ninety percent right, I guess. Um, I uh, I am an urban planner now, uh, except I'm trying to not be an urban planner. I'm trying to be an academic at the moment, so I can investigate this question that's been kind of bugging me through a lot of my career, uh, especially the most recent part of it. Um, ha, ha, but it's all been kind of informed from long ago. I, I actually started out as an archaeologist um, a long, long time ago. Um, and at some point on a, in the middle of a dig, I realized what I, was, what I was doing was kind of over and done with and kind of finished. And I, I wanted to find a way to make what I was doing a little more relevant and uh, kind of realized that urban planning was like archaeology for the future and the urban planning was... Uh, archaeology was like urban planning for the past, uh, and it, you know, like a light bulb went on over my head, and I, you know, I realized that that was probably what I needed to be doing. Um, and you know, as such, I kind of eased my way into this into this profession. And first kind of question, that, you know, the first kind of motivation that I really, you know, kind of got me in there was, you know, how can we make our surroundings, the things that we build, uh, you know, that is our environment, a little more harmonious with the natural environment? You know, you see examples here of you know, pretty pretty typical things where, you know, the, the edges are just really rough and it, you know, it really has no regard for uh, the natural surroundings and things, things like this, you know, that's actually me standing there on one, one last lone tree. Everything's been graded off around it. Um, it seems inappropriate, right? Um, so in my, in my hometown, in my home area of Colorado, I, uh, I kind of maneuvered my way into local government there and uh, found myself administrating some uh, some land developments there and trying to, you know, got, got involved in, um, you know, trying to protect wildlife corridors, you know, especially for some, some particular areas here. Um, there's one particular corridor here that this development uh, would have blocked uh, a migration corridor for a lynx that, that took up about six months of my life for a while. A lot of, a lot of angry people and presumably a lot of unhappy lynx. Uh, but we shut it down, so a little moderate success. Uh, and then, you know, moving on, I ended up working overseas. Uh, I, was just, I, was, I was literally the first urban planner working for the government of Abu Dhabi in something like 30, 35 years. And, I, and uh, me and a lot of other really talented people from all over the world, uh, more so them than me, I, I just wound up being the administrator and kind of like figuring out how to apply a lot of their lofty goals. Uh, came up with the first urban structure framework plan, the first urban plan for what was at the time the second fastest growing city in the world. Um, uh, a lot of really, really good work here. Um, you can see here some, some really rapid uh, growth plans here that w w you may or may not be able to see it, but like a lot of just chaotic, chaotic development. A lot of this would have uh, destroyed um, manatee habitat, some, some mangroves. Um, and long story short, this, is be this has been preserved in na as a, nat a national park. Uh, a lot of the chaotic urban form has been tied together through some of these you know, streets and bridges, and it's all kind of been done in a way that you know, kind of respects the environment and a lot of habitat, and hopefully reduce, you know, the idea being to you know, reduce energy consumption as much as possible, you know, based on a lot of these principles that uh, I helped design. Um, and I also had to had to implement uh, the first development approval protocol in this really rapidly growing city. Uh, what had previously just been uh, a guy, the absolute monarch, listening to somebody pitch an idea and then him semi-arbitrarily, depending on whether you think politics are arbitrary or not, um, you know, allocating land somewhat randomly across the landscape around his like rapidly growing city for various disparate crazy ideas. <laughs> 
Um, so that was that was very useful and very controversial. Um, yeah, th I mean the growth. This is supposed to be 10 years of growth right here on, on kind of the fastest growing part of the city, uh, going from maybe you know 20,000 people to something like 400,000 people. Um, so you know after after that time, I, my you know my my motivations and my questions, what was kind of guiding me through through my career, kind of changed a little bit. Um, because we had a lot of really lofty ideas, uh, but I was noticing most of my successes were things that I was stopping, not not things that you know good things that were actually coming into existence. So you know the new question I was really wondering about: uh, How can environmentally ambitious and progressive designs actually become real? How can we make good things happen? Um, so I, I maneuvered my way into a different job there overseas in Abu Dhabi uh, as manager of urban planning for what I thought was maybe the coolest development in the world at the time. I happened to be there in the city I was living in, fortunately. Uh, something called Mazdar City. Uh, and the first thing, first thing we had to do was take a lot of really lofty, uh, really ambitious uh, goals and uh, figure out, you know, just kind of, first of all, like enumerate them in these principles, which is not something that that project had had before. Uh, Carbon neutrality, first of all, uh, energy positive, generate more energy on, on, the, on the site from the project than it was consuming. Uh, be a home for renewable energy research and just general research into uh, you know, new, new, new technologies for sustainable energy sourcing. Uh, zero waste, uh, zero cars. Uh, and just generally all this, is all this is supposed to be happening in an environment of being able to take risks and test new design and operation strategies. And the sort of midstream, uh, not, not too long after I started there, we were told to change all of that and start using off-the-shelf technology whenever possible at all and make it a commercially viable business. So there's the challenge. <laughs> there's the challenge. Not a unique one at all. Uh, and uh, you know, one I kind of relished, uh, let's, let's figure out how to make this work because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make cool things happen. So one of the very first things uh, that um, you know, I realized we needed was a design, uh, a design guide, you know, something to tell actual architects who were to come in and like, you know, design buildings and engineers who are going to design streets and sewer systems and such, you know, a lot of, a lot of things which had never been done before or never been done in an environment like this or a, you know, an urban strategy like this. Let's, you know, let's tell people how to make this work because we know more about it than anybody else and they don't really know anything, but they want to be involved. You know, they want to know how to do things right. So we got, we got into a lot of details. You know, what, what detail, you know, what angle on this street actually keeps the maximum shade for people walking down here, for instance. You know, a lot of other real specific metrics. Um, you know, linear parks to catch the breeze and just kind of, you know, keep things moving through the city, keep the temperatures down as much as possible passively. Um, and I, you know, I got, I got to sort of watch a lot of really interesting, really magnificent designs, uh, well, get proposed, and some of them actually came into existence. This was a particularly interesting one. Uh, they kept a lot of our principles alive, but you know, kept the bottom line in mind, and, and you know, actually would have, you know, according to the proposal anyway, you know, been buildable and you know, make some money for the people who were involved, which was us. You know, it's just kind of the idea. You know, we were a business. We're not just in it for the charity. We were told to be com commercially viable, so everything had to be, you know, commercially viable. Um, it's just a, you know, just a really nice design here. I think really respects the idea of being inside a, a bigger environment, especially in this sort of climate. You know, still some challenges. Still some challenges with interfacing with that actual natural environment as construction went on. And uh, yeah, but it, as part of this process, I started really, you know, to get inside what I thought was magic at the time, kind of magic, uh, but it was really just economics and business, which was something I'd never really had any exposure to at that point. Uh, you know, how do you take something, uh, you know, that's such a lofty idea and it's really aspirational and ambitious and actually make it into something that be buildable when, you know, when your priorities are commercial viability or like when your demand is that. So, you know, I, I learned a lot of things in this, as, as part of this process, you know, how, what types of real estate are more profitable, what types of real estate need to happen for others if you want anything to happen at all. Um, you know, the fact that hot, taller buildings actually might have more income because there's more things in, in there to lease, you know, the things I just hadn't thought of before, but are really kind of basic, really.
if you think about it. And then on top of that, as construction went on, uh, a lot of last minute decisions just happened. Uh, you know, this is may maybe we couldn't get this material in time. Maybe it couldn't. Maybe it didn't fit the way we thought it would. So it's just kind of, you know, at the very end, the commissioning of something didn't really happen. Like like these particular panels were very very expensive, and so they were kind of canceled at the last minute. Unfortunately, they were, you know. We had to have these particular panels to reach a lot of our materials, you know, carbon balance and, and a lot of the daylighting inside to keep the, you know, air conditioning from using too much energy, things like that. Um, and, the, you know, in particular, uh, these superstructures for uh, the solar panels on top of the buildings were like uh, prohibitively expensive, something you might not have ever even thought of, but it became a deal breaker. Uh, so the strategy became move a lot of energy sourcing off, off site was kind of breaking one of our principles. Um, I eventually, you know, decided to leave that for various political reasons and just because I wanted to come back to North America and I, I played around with different development ideas. Here's a, here's a cool thing I did, uh, kind of a, a farm to table restaurant and lodge, uh, somewhat nestled in a, an agricultural resort community, low density with an operating agricultural landscape around it. Um, but you know, with all all of this kind of, uh, it, you know, evolved what you know what I was really investigating, and that brings me to what I'm doing here now. Uh, how can a better understanding of the influence of financial factors on sustained design decisions be used to increase achievement of sustainability and regenerativity targets in the built environment? Yeah, that's my research question right now, and it's it's a mouthful. There's a lot of words in there, so let's let's back off a little bit and try to understand this. Uh, you know, the title of this talk, How Do Financial Factors Influence Sustainable Design Decisions? Well, let's start with some assumptions. Uh, first, that uh, neoliberal agents are the primary agents of urban change around the world right now. Business people trying to make some money. People who own land trying to do something with that land. You know, you, know, th th you see a lot of these around town. This is a very, very useful little example of this. There's a lot of a lot of people talking about aspirational things for their community that don't have anything to do with this, or they don't think it has anything to do with this building coming up right here in this little picture. Uh, and you know, typical, typical, this is what we all think developers are really, right? Um, <laughs> there's many exceptions to that as I, you know, as, as I started unpacking these assumptions. So let's, you know, so I tried to map it out. Let's, let's, let's figure this out. Let's, let's, let's figure out what I'm tackling here. So different sets of goals here, often in opposition. Uh, there's, the, there's the community goals, this is the sustainability goals, and then there's developers' goals. Uh, collective, broad, you know, a lot of you know, a lot of people at once, you know, large scale stuff, and the developer, you know, rather selfish. Uh, the sustainable goals, the community goals, more long term looking, more more further off in the horizon. The developer usually wants to make a buck pretty quick and get out. Um, but you know, then there's externalities. There's legacy. You know, a developer worries about his reputation, and and you know, more specifically for the business aspect, his market perception. So getting messy. So I tried to map it all out, and it turned into this. Um, and it, you know, it, it gets even messier. But right in here is where all the good stuff is happening. This is really where I want to do most of my investigation. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a lot of this further. But there's. Um, you know, there's there's known very there's like quantified and unquantified and you know guessing involved, and a lot of you know a lot of these influence back and forth. You know, the market expectations influence um, how you calculate uh, your, your your guesses on your future income. There's just a lot of different interplay here, and I'm really hoping to understand this better. So here are my research questions. How can a better understanding of the influence of financial factors on sustainable design decisions be used to increase achievement of sustainability and regenerative targets in the built environment? Um, I guess it's worth mentioning really quickly the difference between sustainability and regenerativity. Sustainability is, yeah, well, you probably all understand that. There's you know three different components: financial, environmental, and social. Uh, it's 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 you know kind of looking forward into the future, right? And just having a respect for. A lot of the stuff I was just talking about, you know, a lot of respect for the environment around you and just how we keep things sustained. But regenerativity is a step beyond, and a lot of us probably know this too. It's it's not just like maintaining a balance. It's like how do we make these things that we're building or these things we're doing as humans? How do we 
just not feel guilt, you know, not feel like we need to minimize our touch on the landscape, our ecological footprint? How can we make what we do actually regenerative and a positive influence on the natural landscape, the ha habitat, just you know, energy, energy usage, all these things. So, so to get into this with our built environment, these are, here's some specific sub questions I'm asking. Which design decisions for a developer are more often driven by which factors? Financial influences, whether quantified or guesses or heuristic, educated guesses, or other influences, and what are these influences? And how do aspects of the larger than building scale, a neighborhood scale, influence decision making for sustainability targets or more specifically regenerativity targets for a single building? So there's there's a balance here. You know, there's there's the the core really selfish target uh, goals for a property owner trying to build something or do something with land, um, and then there's the broader goals which spread out in both in space and in you know spread forward in time. Uh, okay, so to really analyze this, they need some variables. They need something to look at for both of these things. Um, so for these. Sustainability targets, anyway. Fortunately, there's something out there that's being used by many developers as a proxy for all of these fuzzy goals. Uh, it, it's LEED. It's a it's a green certification system for buildings. And um, it, you know, it, it, they've gone ahead and waited. You know, for better or worse. You know, this is definitely something you can argue with. But it's it's being used all the time as a stand-in for all these different goals. Uh, they, they, the system has weighted and given prioritization for different categories of these goals. So sustainable sites where you put your development, uh, this is all out of 110. Um, water efficiency, what, you know, consumption of water, energy and atmosphere, that's uh, you know, pollutants being you know, put out into the atmosphere and ventilation and stuff like that, and also energy consumption and generation. Uh, materials and resources, uh, which you use to build the building. Uh, indoor environmental quality, that's a lot of different things. That's materials also. Uh, innovation and in di in design, a lot of room for you know, adding in extra things. Regional priority, sometimes there's specific things that you can add in, but it's, obviously it's not weighted very much. So you can see here energy consumption and where you put the thing are really the highest priority. And this is all out of 110. And you know, there's different levels of certification here. The basic one, you have to get 40 points. Uh, the highest one, platinum, you have to get 80 points. And there, there's a lot of studies into whether, whether this certification and other certifications by themselves uh, are actually useful in terms of you know, the business goals of a land developer, these neoliberal goals. Uh, but nobody's really ever un, uh, unpacked and really tried to analyze the individual design decisions that all of these things represent. Uh, in, inside the sustainable sites category, there's a lot of different things. There's a, a lot of different little credits that you can either choose to go for or not choose to go for to get to your 110 points, for instance. Um, okay, so for the developer goals, let's, you know, I, I need some variables too. Uh, and it's really not worth trying to explain what any of these mean. Uh, they're all just different ways of uh, taking a, an expected or hoped for future income and valuing it in today's dollars. And some of them are probably more likely to be used for different types of design decisions. You know, different design decisions will impact these numbers in different ways. Uh, and then there's also the guesses, you know, because some of the, it, and you know, figuring out the, the line, the difference between what is a guess and what is actually a real calculated internal rate of return, for instance, which is, you know, at the end of the day, it's really just a very educated guess if, if you've got the best data possible because you don't really know what's going to happen in the future. But then sometimes it's really just a guess. It's a heuristic. Um, and then on top of that, ex externalities, legacy factors. How does that factor into your, your choices? How, how do you turn this into a very, how do you value that? Uh, and, and market perception, it's a little more directly valuable, but how do you reach that valuation? Uh, so uh, really, this is, this is what I want to get after. What factors influence which individual design choices and how? How do external factors influence these choices? The legacy factors, market perception, maybe something I'm not thinking of. Uh, so to do this, I've been kind of talking to breaking down the resistance of uh, four different development entities around North America, one of which has, has arms uh, globally and does different things in different parts of the world, which is really interesting to me. Um, I can't really, I don't really, 
you know, when you when you look at the ethical review policies of the University of British Columbia, it's you know it, it's obviously conceived of to like protect vulnerable populations, which is a great thing, and um, we're, we're looking at essentially like rich business people here, probably not the most vulnerable populations. But when you really think about it, um, a lot of the information I want to get to is is it's intellectual property, and it's really you know it's really held close to the breast by a lot of these guys, and so we're trying to negotiate. Uh, just just how much information I'll be able to have access to and how much I'll be able to publish uh, you know in, in, in my thesis uh, because this becomes a public document right and how we do this anonymously or not you know maybe they want to you know get some public credit for participating in this you know there's a lot of different things in play here a lot of moving pieces that I still haven't really worked out yet but I have an institutional developer here in Vancouver you know that's a little dipping down there it's not really just Point Roberts that's Vancouver um, uh, of like a more more typical like condo developer in in Toronto uh, with, with a lot of aspirations for doing things the right way, and then an affordable uh, affordable affordable uh, home developer in Los Angeles, and then uh, a global developer in Los Angeles. Oh, too many. Um, so. You know, I plan to I plan to target the interviews for the main decision makers. You know, the guys the guys are women who actually make the decisions on what design elements go or don't go. And then, if if I'm not really getting the right information from them, or I need some more data from somebody, you know, I'll I'll do the snowball technique and find somebody else to talk to. And um, I imagine I'll end up talking to four or five or six people at each one of these entities. Um, and as I go along, I'll try to ask for financial data to you know, compare what their interview responses are telling me. Um, because I expect a lot, of, a lot of squishiness with the responses. So actual financial data will be really interesting and helpful. Uh, and that's where I'm at right now. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. You don't have a question yet? Oh, oh yeah, in the back. Um, yeah, they're out there, and and I know they're out there, but they're they're kind of. Uh, they're kind of outside of, the, well, first of all, they're smaller scale, uh, and they're also outside, that they're not really going for a LEED certification or any other kind of, often, you know, they're not going for any certification because they're just outside that completely, uh, any like living building challenge or anything like that. Uh, so they don't really fit in the, you know, into my research. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mostly it's time. That's that's an external yeah, that's an external factor, but it's kind of a known um that that's 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 kind of a known factor and it's also very locationally specific. It's it's really specific to the local context you're in. Um, you know, some some cities, some jurisdictions don't have uh, really any any control or very very few control or it's very very known or maybe you know exactly what you're getting into with your particular property uh, or maybe you want to do something that's just completely not allowed on your particular piece of land or your, your district and then you you know you're looking at a lot of unknowns there a lot of you know maybe it's going to be six months maybe it's going to be three years of hassling who knows um, but there's a lot of that, that's not really I think that's like a known variable does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of this research, I think, will help um, help fine tune a lot of those policies, a lot of those regulations, right? Because I think a lot of those policies are put in place, not necessarily here in Vancouver, which I think is very progressive in understanding how developers work. You know, a lot of the planning here in Vancouver is done with a lot of awareness from developers, a lot of input from developers for you know for better or for worse. And I think uh, you know the, the regulators know what they're doing to the developers when they ask for a certain thing. Um, but it, in a lot of jurisdictions, that's not known. So this, you know, what comes out the other end of this research will be able to really fine tune, I think, a lot of regulation. Yeah, Hadi. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that will be sure. That's like one. That's already in the market. We can ask the developer. For example, the floor you're standing on, the B-side of rubber. Yeah. You would need points for this building. Right. You can compare the price of that to non-decide for the equivalent of the floor. I remember how much more it was. Right, so that would be a non-heuristic value right there. That's a known thing. With a lot, a lot of the, it's good to know what's known and what's not known. I think you know, because you know, when I was going around doing pre-interviews for this, uh, you know, I would talk to designers and planners, and you know, everybody, th those type of people get really excited about this, you know, that, because that's kind of where I'm coming from. We all want to know really how these decisions get made. But when I interviewed developers, a lot of developers don't really understand why I'm doing this at all. They, they don't even under, they don't, there's no mystery there at all. And that, I think that's what you're kind of talking about. Um, yeah, but that's that's a guess. Well, he tried, sure, and then you know that number moves up and down. You know that's a, and again, you're talking about a broad certification right there, not an individual design choice and how that affects the value of, you know, what his eventual sale price is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're willing to wait around for the, yeah. Yeah, that's that's why I wanted to include an institutional uh, developer in there because they're usually the ones that stick around and occupy and manage the property, uh, you know, versus like a, a condo developer, a high-rise developer that just you know builds it and sells and moves on, uh, left with nothing but their reputation and what you know what they left behind. Thanks.